Hello and welcome to Through the Bible. So it's Easter Monday, 2019, and we want today to look at what's called the longer ending of Mark, which is Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. Yesterday was Easter, 2019, and we did a video on and a podcast on Mark 16, 1 through 8, but I didn't want to talk about uh, the uh, textual issues with Mark 16, 9 through 20 on Easter, because Easter is about the resurrection, and we wanted to celebrate the resurrection. And so I wanted to uh, do a separate podcast and video on Mark 16, 9 through 20. Now, uh, I want to make it very clear, uh, as I begin this podcast and video, that I don't have any problem with the content of Mark 16, 9 through 20. There is nothing uh, heretical, I don't believe. There's nothing um, bad about the content of Mark 16, 9 through 20. Nobody who uh, engages in the discussion we're having today um, does so for that reason. Uh, there may be some who have issues with the snake handling <laughs> or the drinking of poison. But I actually, I'll, I'll, I'll show you my hand, um, literally if you're watching the video, and, and say that I don't personally think that these verses were in the very first copy of Mark. So when, you know, when Mark, maybe he dictated it to a scribe or an amanuensis, or maybe Mark used the stylus himself, but, you know, Mark wrote the gospel, the very first copy. We don't know exactly where he was. Maybe it was at Rome. And he gets to the end of 16. There's a true false question here. In that very first copy, handwritten, manuscript, handwritten, copy of Mark, did it end at verse 8? Did it end at verse 20? Or was there some other ending uh, that was there? That's a factual question. It's a question of truth. Now, a lot of times we talk about truth, but I personally think that a lot of times when people talk about truth, they mean their tradition or their tribe. I'm talking about the real truth. That is, that, that if we had a camera uh, that had videotaped Mark when he finished Mark, how did it end? And uh, if we try, I'm convinced that the best way for us to try to arrive at that kind of a truth is using evidence and reason. Um, because God hasn't written on the sky, the ending of Mark is original. I mean, you know what I mean? Who are you going to refer to uh, as an authority to tell you that these verses were original. Um, uh, you know what I'm saying? It's not in the Bible. <laughs> this is a question about uh, the Bible. Um, uh, it, so the Bible doesn't... <laughs> anyway, there's a circular reasoning there I, I won't go into if you were to say, well, the Bible says it's there. No, maybe the Bible you bought at the Christian bookstore has it there or doesn't have it there. But, but this is the question we're asking. What did the Bible actually say? And that's a question that is outside of the Bible. Uh, it, it just there's no there's no answer there's no way to answer it within the Bible um, because we don't have the original copy. We don't have the original copies of any book of the Bible. Don't worry, we pretty much know what it means. This is the biggest issue, by the way, when it comes to these sorts of issues. Most of the differences between the different handwritten copies are are small little differences that are easily figured out. This is the big one, you know. Um, don't worry, it's not like you're gonna find a million of these. This is the big, the biggie, the big textual uh, question. And so the best way to arrive at it is to look at the evidence and, and reason it through um, and figure it out. I mean, what other recourse do we have? Uh, so, because the church fathers didn't agree on this, um, so it would seem that Irenaeus knows of this ending. He lived in the late 100s. And yet, uh, people like Eusebius, around 300, or Jerome, around 400, they, make, they say that they don't find this ending in most of the Greek manuscripts that they have. Um, and, and many early fathers, uh, uh, church fathers like Origen, from around 200, never mentions this ending. On the other hand, Tertullian, from around 200, does. And so... Who are you going to, who, who's, on whose authority are you going to say that these verses should be there or shouldn't uh, be there? Um, we're stuck. Uh, 
We just have to reason it out. We have no other choice. There is no authority within Scripture or with outside of Scripture um, to whom we can ref take recourse um, as an authority to say these verses are or aren't there. We're stuck with reason and, and uh, evidence. And so uh, the question is, um, basically, where does the evidence lie uh, with regard to uh, this ending? Uh, let, me, let me also start by saying there is another shorter ending out there in the manuscripts. Most of the time, it's kind of stuck in between verse 8 and the longer ending. Uh, but this is an artifact. It's kind of like there, there was an early time, it, it would seem, there was an early time when manuscripts didn't have an ending here. And it's kind of like a tooth that hurts because, oh, this doesn't seem like it's the place where the tooth should end uh, because Mark 16, 8 ends with, and the women told no one because they were afraid. That seems like a strange place to end the Gospel of Mark, although I talked in yesterday's podcast about some who think that that's intentional on Mark's uh, 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 part. Uh, so watch yesterday's, uh, watch the podcast on uh, Mark 16, 1 through 8, if you want to know about those who think that this is where the original gospel ended. But apparently, I, my, I personally wonder if the original ending was lost at a very, very early date, um, before, before the year 100, um, maybe, you know, uh, maybe even you know, very early, maybe even in the 80s, who knows. But that at some very, very early stage of the transmission of Mark, uh, the longer the, there was no uh, the the ori original ending was lost. I I wonder. That's where I would vote. If I have to take a quiz, a multiple choice quiz, and you put the options as uh, the original ending of Mark was a um, Mark sixteen nine through twenty, B um, Mark sixteen eight, C an ending that's lost, or D the shorter ending found in some manuscripts. I'm going to put some ending that was lost, probably. I have a colleague, uh, Dave Smith, who would say, no, it was meant to end at 16.8. Um, but there is a shorter ending. I don't know of anybody who actually thinks this is the original ending. But there's some manuscripts, and you can see this usually in the footnotes uh, in your Bible. There's a shorter ending that goes like this. And they announced briefly all the things that had been told to those around Peter. And after these things, Jesus himself sent through them from east to west, the holy and incorruptible message of eternal salvation. Amen. Um, this is not a very well-attested ending. I think there's one Latin manuscript that ends right there. Uh, in most manuscripts that have this shorter ending, they then go on to give the longer ending. There are a few Syriac manuscripts, a few Coptic manuscripts, a few Ethiopic manuscripts, and some other miscellaneous manuscripts that have the shorter ending and the longer ending. But what this, again, using common sense, it suggests that at some point, some early point, uh, Mark ended at verse 8, and there were those who felt like this was not an appropriate ending uh, for the gospel story. And so this, this shorter ending, like a cap on a tooth, you know, was put there um, uh, to keep the pain receptors from hurting when you, when you chew, uh, if you get my analogy. So the shorter ending was used to cap uh, the, the Gospel of Mark um, with an ending that is a bit strange, with the women telling no one. However, other, uh, at, uh, at another point, um, I would say that this longer ending was used to cap um, Mark 16. And it was very early. It was in the second century. We have, we have some early witnesses to Mark 16. Uh, there was a guy named Tatian, uh, who about 160, um, wrote the first harmony of the four Gospels. And in his harmony of the four Gospels, the ending of Mark is, is there. Um, and also, uh, I mentioned Irenaeus seems to refer uh, to this uh, longer ending. Most don't. So most of the fathers, um, uh, and especially we have the witness of Eusebius and Jerome, don't, don't find this ending on most manuscripts. And the two earliest manuscripts of, of this part of Mark that we have, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, a codex is a book uh, form manuscript, 
Um, they date from the early 300s. Neither of them have this longer ending. And they're the earliest uh, actual manuscript witness we have uh, to the ending of Mark, and they don't have it. Many other Greek manuscripts that do have it have notes that say this isn't in a lot of manuscripts. And so uh, this is what we call the external evidence. The weight of the external evidence is, is against these verses being original, not only because the earliest manuscripts don't have it, but because of the fathers, the church fathers, who basically say that it wasn't in most manuscripts that they knew of. Um, and also the, the existence, the very existence of the shorter ending suggests that uh, there was no ending here on early manuscripts. Now, none of that really convinced me uh, when I was um, going through my uh, education. Um, I grew up on the King James. I love the King James. I find the King James a majestic uh, translation. And so I was resistant uh, to the ideas that these uh, that this these verses were not original. I was resistant to, to that idea. What finally convinced me was not the manuscript evidence, because it seems to me that manuscript evidence uh, can be manipulated in various ways. Um, and there are early witnesses to this ending, although not in Greek manuscripts. But what convinced me is what's called internal evidence. In internal evidence, we basically use our common sense to say, which is more likely, that an end, this thing was added in or that this thing was taken out? And I'm not sure that I can come up with any real good explanation for why someone would intentionally uh, take out this ending. Um, but I can come up with a storyline. This is what you do with internal evidence. You come up with a kind of storyboard, uh, to a scenario, uh, but to try to, which is more likely, this scenario or this scenario? Which is more likely, that this ending was part of the first copy of Mark and that somehow it dropped out, or that this ending was somehow added in? And what convinced me that these verses were not part of the original is verse 9. Verse 9 says in the longer ending, Having arisen early on the first of the week, Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Now, this is really bizarre, because we've just heard about Mary Magdalene in 16, um, one or 2, is it? Let me go back up here. Yes, 16.1. When the Sabbath had passed, Mary the Magdalene and all these other women came to anoint him. This is a kind of story, right? Um, very early, they came. They were saying, who's going to roll away the stone? And there the stones roll away, and there's a young man. He says, don't be afraid. Now, notice how... Verse 9 starts all over again. And having arisen early on the first week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he cast out seven demons. And it's like, ooh, I'm having deja vu all over again. We just had this verse. Why is it starting over again? And in fact, the character of the verses that follow is not the same as the verses we've just looked at. See how many, how, how the, this is more like a normal story. They went here, they went there. The stones rolled away. How are we going to find it? They speak, you know, you know, don't be alarmed. You're seeking Jesus the Nazarene. But you see, starting with verse 9, it takes on the character of a summary. This, 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 this. You know what I mean? It's not, it's no longer a kind of extended blow-by-blow -blow story. It's more of a summary, 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 summary. And so uh, verse 9, the fact that it starts over again, is what convinced me because I basically at some point came and said, you know what, if I'm actually interested in, in the truth, I'm not, not in defending what I believe, but in, in listening to the evidence and using sound reasoning and asking what is the most likely conclusion to draw from here. There's a shift. That's a shift that takes place. And I'm gonna, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm telling my own story here. I underwent a shift where I basically said to myself, am I, am I interested in what is really true, or am I only interested in my tradition? Um, and uh, it took a bit of a crisis for me to work through this. But I finally determined that what is really true is what God thinks. What my tradition thinks well, that's just where I've come from. That's just my culture. That's just, you know, where I happen to 
uh, to be born where I happen to grow up. Tradition is something, everybody has a tradition. And everybody's tradition has to be mostly wrong, right? Because we're all different. And so I, I, was, I asked myself, I need, if I'm going to have faith, I need something solid. And what was solid, it seemed to me, um, was, was to, uh, again, not to abandon your tradition, I'm not saying that, but to have a faith-seeking understanding. And a faith-seeking understanding doesn't just throw out your faith for reason. That's not what I'm saying. But, but it basically says, okay, look, I'm going to try to go with the most likely conclusion, not the conclusion that feels good, because that's, ironically, the person who goes with the tradition is more relativist in the end, uh, because they're basically, now they wouldn't say this, but the person who goes with their tradition is basically saying, well, I'm going with my truth. The person who really believes in truth is the person who's willing to change their position given enough evidence and or uh, reason. Um, if you, if you, if you will never, if there's no scenario where you will change your mind, then you're not really interested in truth, in my opinion. Um, and so if, if I'm convinced that anyone who is really interested in the truth is going to look at verse nine and say, yeah, this was added on because it's not in the flow of the first eight verses. It doesn't fit. Uh, it's, it's like, it's something, and now for something completely different. Well, again, uh, feel free to disagree with me. Uh, please don't send me hate mail. Uh, but but I, I truly don't think there's any question here. Um, and of course, the vocabulary changes a little. That's not definitive, but I think there are like 18 words in this ending that don't appear elsewhere in Mark. That's not a definitive argument, but it is yet part of this cumulative case. Um, both of, So the manuscripts tend to, to go against it, um, and the... Um, Internal common sense tends to go against it. The internal vocabulary tends to go against it. I just really feel like if you're really interested in the truth, um, in what God thinks, um, you're going to go with the most likely answer, uh, which in this case is that this ending is not original. But again, there's nothing wrong with this ending. Don't get me wrong. There is nothing theologically wrong with this ending. It's good stuff. That's not the question. The question is, if you could take a picture of Mark when he finished the very first copy, would this have been there? And I think the objective answer is probably not. Uh, okay, but having said that, let's go through these verses because there's nothing wrong with these verses. In fact, I, I think someone once suggested that these verses might have been um, in a early Christian work. Maybe there was another early Christian work, you know, that told the story, summarized the story of Jesus, you know, and maybe this was part of it, and when you, well, we need an ending like this on Mark, you know, so it was taken and put on, uh, on Mark, maybe, who knows. Uh, verse 9, having risen early on the first of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Now, uh, in my opinion, this is someone summarizing the resurrection appearances and events. And so uh, the character, I, th I believe that these verses actually draw here from Acts, here from John, here from Luke. And so the, the author has taken material from the other Gospels and from Acts and systematized, su summarized them here. And so certainly in the Gospel of Mark, Mary is the first one um, uh, mentioned, although Mark 1 through 8 doesn't tell about his appearance to them. Matthew does. Matthew talks about his appearance to the women. And of course, the Gospel of John tells us about Jesus' appearance to Mary Magdalene as the first person to whom Jesus appeared. And this mention of her being the one from whom he cast out seven demons, that is a reference taken from Luke 8, uh, as we said in uh, the podcast on Mark 16, 1 through 8. Verse 10, that one, that is Mary, having gone, announced to the ones who had been with him, who were crying and weeping. And they, having heard that he lives and was seen by her, did not believe. Now, um, of course, the, the lack of understanding of the disciples is a key feature of the Gospel of Mark. A key feature of, of this ending of Mark is the disbelief of the disciples. That The word apisteo, which I don't believe occurs in the rest of Mark, occurs several times uh, as a theme in these endings, that the disciples do not believe originally. That's actually a little harder on the disciples 
um, than um, I think the other Gospels are. Um, although, you know, Matthew says some doubted, but they don't believe here. They don't believe her. Um, whereas the beloved disciple does believe something uh, in the Gospel of John. Uh, verse 12, and after these things, Jesus appeared to two of them. Jesus was in a different form as, as they were going into a field. So this seems to me to be an allusion uh, to Luke 24 and the men on the road to Emmaus. So you see how Mark, this ending is, this ending is drawing from uh, the other Gospels and Acts. 13, and having gone away, those having gone away, they sent to the rest, and not even then did they believe those men. Now, that again is stronger than Luke 24, because they do, uh, Jesus appears to them while they're talking in Luke 24. So this is a kind of a harsh, uh, harsh ending. Um, I'd like to think the disciples had more faith than this ending is suggesting that they did. Verse 14, later, uh, Jesus appeared to the eleven while they were reclining at table, and he scolded their unbelief and hard-heartedness because they did not believe those who had seen him having been risen. Now, this is interesting uh, because in Matthew and Luke and John, this appearance happens on the same night. So there is a little variation uh, from the other gospel accounts um, that, that would be kind of hard to fit together, I think, if we had to, um, to take this ending and uh, consider it part of the original gospel of Mark. Again, see how, how much they disbelieve. Jesus rebukes them for their lack of belief. Uh, verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news, the gospel, to every creature. This is the Mark and Great Commission, which, of course, I think draws from Matthew 28, where he says, go and make disciples of every nation. And here it, he tells them to go uh, and preach uh, to them. So... Go and preach the good news to every creature. Um, verse 16, the one who has believed and been baptized will be saved, but the one who has not believed will be condemned. Uh, baptism plays uh, a role here, a stronger role in salvation perhaps uh, than elsewhere uh, in the New Testament. Although it's interesting, it doesn't say the one who's not believed will be condemned. It doesn't say the one who has not believed and has not been baptized will be condemned. So this verse doesn't indicate condemnation for those who aren't uh, baptized, but it does indicate that baptism is part of being saved. Um, and of course, uh, perhaps salvation here is referring to the time when Christ will return, although it, it's not very explicit. And signs will follow uh, those who believe these things. See how important faith is uh, in this ending of Mark. Uh, signs will follow those who believe these things. And of course, that's true in the book of Acts. Uh, we have some uh, sense of, uh, I think, the book of Acts uh, as the source for uh, these next two verses. They will cast out demons in my name, happens in Acts for sure. They will speak in new tongues, happens in Acts, of course. Uh, verse 18, they will take up snakes, and if they drink poison, it will never harm them. This is, of course, the favorite verse for, for snake handling churches. I wonder if verse 18 is an allusion to Paul on the island of Malta, where a viper bite, bites him, but he does not die. Uh, now, I can't think offhand of any place where um, a Christian drank poison and it didn't harm them. If they put their hands on the sick, they will become well. And of course, uh, we see this also in the book of Acts. So you see my, my argument that this, uh, this ending, very early, may be dating from the mid-2nd century, maybe from a summary of Jesus' works, something that's been lost uh, to time, um, that, that this whoever composed this ending is drawing from various scenes from the other Gospels uh, and from Acts. And then, verse 19 and 20, after speaking to them, the Lord Jesus was taken up into the sky, or into heaven, uh, same word, and he sat on the right of God, on the right hand of God. Again, a key early Christian theme in the Bible. Verse 20, and having those having gone out, preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the signs that accompanied them. So there's nothing of nothing drastically wrong with these verses. It is kind of harsh on the disciples and their unbelief. Um, and it does have this 
interesting statement about drinking poison uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what that refers to. But in general, there, these verses are, are, are mostly just recounting um, various events that did take place in the early church uh, that we have record of from the other Gospels and Acts. And so the storyline, the storyboard that most, uh, most scholars would go with is that at, at some very early point, either the original ending of the gospel was lost or it was felt that verse 8 was a strange place to end. And so over time, a couple of different endings were put on Mark to, to give it a more pleasing uh, ending. Um, one of which is a shorter ending that was not favored by and large, but the second of which sometime in the mid 100s, someone perhaps taking it from somewhere else, but put this longer ending onto the Gospel of Mark, which is basically a summary of various things that Jesus did in the other Gospels, Matthew, uh, Luke, and John, and Acts. Um, and, and so that there's nothing really wrong with these verses. It's just not likely that they were part of the very first copy uh, of uh, the Gospel uh, of Mark. And so there we have it. Uh, I, I wonder, I mentioned in the, um, the podcast of, Math, of Mark, 1, uh, Mark, 8, uh, Mark 16, 1 through 8, uh, that Ben Witherington might be uh, somewhat correct here uh, when he thinks that um, basically Matthew 28 gives us a sense of, of some of the nature of the rest of uh, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, assuming that Matthew used Mark as a primary source, as most scholars think, and that therefore the material in Matthew uh, that goes beyond verse uh, 8 here might give us some sense of what the original ending of Mark might have said. Um, but, it, but at some point, it was a very early point, it apparently was lost. Um, I know another scholar, uh, Clayton Croy, who I believe argues that maybe the beginning and the ending of Mark, which would have been the outer the outer leaf of a, of a book, you know, that maybe it came off. I, I personally am not convinced of that, uh, but it's an interesting thought. Scholars say the most interesting things, don't they? <laughs> or not. Well, this has been the longer ending of Mark uh, as we finish up our Easter weekend.